Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today I'm taking a look at Broken Realms Kragnos, the final installment in the Broken Realms trilogy uh, from Games Workshop, uh, which I was sent as a free sample to check out um, and show you guys. Now, of course, all the info as usual has been leaked and floating around on the internet. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is go through the book, talk a little bit about the background for Broken Realms, um, and just kind of talk about changes and what's happening with all of these World Scroll updates and what I think about them. Because uh, that seems to be the, the new format I'm doing for doing this. And this is a basically a battle tome update, an interim battle tone update uh, between editions. Uh, we are obviously looking at 3rd edition Warhammer Age of Sigmar coming out in June. Um, I believe today actually the Dominion box is getting spoiled, which is the big cool new, I assume, two-player star set. I don't know. They've hinted at it. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday beforehand, so I don't know what's in it yet. Um, but I'm excited to check that out too. Uh, and this adds a big new deity model, which is Kragnos. He's available as an ally to every destruction faction. He basically wakes up from where the slan have him trapped uh, after him and his species are nearly wiped out in a great war against the drakes. So he, he fights the lizards, the dragons, the big star drakes, all that stuff. Uh, who are allied with Order and is, you know, this rampaging god monster that seems to have come from a race of rampaging god monsters. It's a bit of a, like, play on the ancient Greek myths of, like, the titans fighting against the gods and yada yada yada. GW, you know what I mean? Everything's an allegory to real life mythologies and stuff like that and kind of a uh, ode to something else. Um, and this updates a bunch of battle tomes. So a lot like the Psychic Awakening series in 40k, if you're familiar with that, this is basically taking battle tomes and giving them an update and then kind of just weaving a narrative around that to make it compelling and kind of give there to be a reason why people change and get different and stuff like that. Um, it's laid out in a fun way. This is a, the Dramatis Person I think is actually I think pioneered by, I believe Dan Abnett when he first started writing the Horse Heresy books. That was just kind of a fancy way of saying like, you know, as Shakespeare and like, here are our players set to play the game. Um, and features, of course, Kragnos, Alario, Marathi Kane, Sigmar, as like the big gods doing all this stuff. Gordrak the Fistagorg, Skragarth the Loom King, Gulgaz Stoneclaw, Glog, and Durko Walrus Spider, big giant, um, dry, uh, uh, what should we call it, Sons of Behemoth, giant. Um, and then the story going through all of why everything has changed. So the Battle updates themselves, uh, in addition to having a campaign for playing Broken Realms, little campaign stuff in different Realm Battle games in Gur which is where Kragnos wakes up and bursts back into the scene. Um, you're gonna get Kragnos himself, the End of Empires, uh, a Gloom Spike gets update date, which if you haven't seen it, basically takes all the expansions that were in all the White Dwarfs and just codifies them into a book. I haven't noticed any big differences, but I'm gonna go through them with uh, Owen at some point and see if there's anything really changed. Mostly it just pulls them all together and then updates the Loon Shrine so that really it was the thing that kept getting changed so you could bring back different units. Uh, it just puts it all in that War Scroll basically. Um, and then you've got some Sylvanas stuff. Alario gets another rewrite. <laughs> uh, she's up, she's down, she's left, she's right. Um, and then the Warsong Redmond has its rules, the cool new, um, like, Piper of Doom. Uh, the Awakened Wild Road gets some new rules, and Drika's Spike Grove, which is a battalion, which, of course, who knows the value of battalions? Because there's been a bunch of talk of them going away in match play, even though they still have point values, which is weird, and they're in all the battle tomes, but also there's maybe core battalions that are a new thing that's being introduced in third. We don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, the Heat Knights of Slanesh get Dexessa and Sinessa, the Talon and Voice of Slanesh, and then the Exquisite Pursuit, which is a big war scroll. Uh, new City of Sigmar, the Free City of Excelsis, and the rules for the Father, Daughter, Witch Hunter Doer, Doralia Van Denst and Galen Van Denst, who I'm pretty, pretty pumped about. Uh, Seraphon get Lord Croak. Skaven get the Skaven Tide, along with some mutations for Clan Mulder and the uh, Doom Coven, and then the Beasts of Chaos get a bunch of new uh, battalions and stuff too, for the and battle traits for the Beast Lord and the Jabber Slith. Oh, sorry, War Scrolls for the Beast Lord and Jabber Slith. And then you get your pitched battle profiles. So, um, overall, again, the, uh, the, the story is kind of taking another step forward. The unleashing of Kragnos happens. Um, basically as like an aftershock of um, uh, the sort of like the big wars that are currently raging across the mortal realms. Uh, Alariel is fighting and kind of purifying the realm of life again, but the spell that she casts to do so that kind of undoes the Necroquake has a bunch of unforeseen uh, consequences, one of which is of course Kragnos getting loose. Um, and his big like reveal uh, rampaging into life, he's starting to bring together the various, well, not bring together, but he's the biggest, baddest bad in Gur, and so a bunch of the different um, characters like the Loon King, um, the big uh, 
Super Mega Boss for the Oryx. Um, start to ride behind him because they're like, look at this guy, he's going to tear down everything, let's go with him. We get to the Siege of Excelsis, which is the free city built in Gur, and then all of the uh, people who rallied to defend it, which includes, of course, the Slan. And we get a campaign. There's all the gods. Nice color section. Kragnos himself, who is on the Sons of Behemoth base, if you're wondering how big he is. And then this little guy, which looks like it's on a separate base. I don't really know what it is, but I love what it's got going on. I don't, maybe it's a separate base? I'm not 100% sure. Uh, the Reverential Totem, oh, sorry, is what it's called. Uh, Dexessa and Senessa, the voice and talent of Slanesh, two ways to build that kit. The Warsong Revenant, of course, Galen and uh, Darylia Van Denst, and then this sexy new Lord Croak, which is also, of course, a model for a new Slan Mage Priest. We're into the Broken Realms campaign rules. Uh, again, if you haven't checked out the Broken Realms campaign games, they require you to have a bunch of different armies. So, they're cool. They're more the kind of thing you'd run in like a store or like in a like um, big event hall, as of course for a weekend or maybe at a convention. Than they are like something you'd probably be able to do at home because you need to have a Sylvaneth army, a Cities of Sigmar Knights, Ex sorry, a Knights Excelsior Stormcast army, a Kragnos army, so a destruction army with Kragnos in it, um, a Sky Battalion's army, uh, an Excelsis army, and then any Order army. And then the bad guy would have to have a Beastman army, a Skaven army, a Greenskins army, a Destruction army, a Slanesh army, and a Destruction army. So a lot of a lot of different things. Uh, place for the campaign, all the various acts inside and battle plans to go with them. And then battle time updates. Okay, so we got Kragnos, Lewis by Gids, Sylvaneth, He Knights of Slanesh, Cities of Sigmar, Seraphon, Skaven, Beast of Chaos, and then all the point values. Kragnos, what can you say about Kragnos? Well, I mean, he's 760 points of kill you. Uh, he's really only degrading in the number of attacks he gets with his Hoover's Rack, Rack and Ruin. And he loses three inches of movement when he gets, uh, like, hurt. Down to, like, first bracketed at half, and then down to almost 16 plus. So it was 18 wounds and 2 plus save. But he also gets more dangerous, because every time you wound him at the end of the phase, he bellows, and the dice roll to make that go off gets better. So, while he has a slightly diminishing crap, like stat line, like his Hooves of Rack and Ruin go down to three, like half attacks, he loses three inches of movement. He's, he doesn't have, he, he also explodes into mortal wounds. Everything within six of him, every time he's wounded, the end of that phase on a, that dice roll takes D3 mortal wounds. And also scenery features can just explode too, which is interesting if they're, if they're defensible. Um, he rerolls charge rolls, hit rolls, and uh, against, sorry, for like all the time is if he's within 12 of a Star Drake, 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 Author, Drake line, so any of the, the dragon dudes because he hates them. And then he has an impact hit charge, which is okay against everybody. He makes a charge move every unit within one inch uh, on a two plus takes D6 mortal wounds. But if he charges a monster, 50% of the time he just kills it on the charge. Um, because his, his, he rolls 2d6 if it's within one inch on a 7 nothing happens. So that's about 50% of the time on a 2d6 roll. Uh, on any other roll, you multiply the high number by the low number. So if, and the joke is if he rolls a, a box car, so he does 36 mortal wounds to whatever it is he's charging and basically nukes it. But he, on average, if he just hard rolls an 8, he pretty much kills everything. The, he'd do 12 at a minimum hard rolling an 8. But he could also do, oh geez, he could do 15, he could do, yeah, 16 if he, if he double fours. So uh, on an 8+, plus, if he double fours, he probably kills your monster, because 16 wounds is about average for a monster model. Get higher than that. I mean, on a 9, I think he, he does 18 wounds, which doesn't quite kill a giant, but he could do between 18 and 25 <laughs> mortal wounds. Um, sorry, 18 and 20 mortal wounds. Uh, and then on a 10 plus, he basically kills everything. He does 25 mortal wounds. Um, he needs to get to box cars, obviously. I think on 11 plus, he does 30, which doesn't quite kill a, a Sons of Behemoth giant. A Mega Gargant, sorry. But that's a, that's a lot of mortal wounds. And even if he just rolls low, if he rolls like a 6 or less, he's going to do probably 6 to 12 mortal wounds um, on, the, on the, the low end of that. Which is, I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot compared to his potential, but that's still like a absolute butt-ton of moral wounds <laughs> to most things. Um, and that's kind of his gimmick. He's plus on bravery to every destruction model within 12, and then his shield, just on a 3-6 roll, if it's higher than the casting value of whatever's affecting him, it just goes away. 
Uh, so he's kind of immune to magic because the casting roll doesn't matter. And most of the big mages, they can get really high casting rolls, but it doesn't affect what the actual spells cast on. And I can't think of a spell that's cast on an average of 11. So the average 3d6 roll is 10.5-ish, and you're, there's not a lot of spells in the game that cast on higher than 8 or 9. Uh, so you're, you're most likely just, just shrugging off the spells. His basic attacks too, I mean, he doesn't ever degrade with a 3 inch range, 6 attacks, 3s and 2s, minus 3, 4 damage. So his basic like weapon, his Dread Mace, can do 24 wounds. Uh, Tuskbreaker, his shield, can do another 9 potentially. And then the hooves, which do go down, do between 6 and 12. So his he's, he's a big chunkier army at 760. The one thing I will say is he doesn't have the ability to retreat and charge. If he had that Sons of Behemoth thing where he could move over, he had like the Night Titan thing where he could walk away and still like um, like run and charge. This guy's going to be a lot easier than one of the big Mega Gargants to pin down um, and keep in combat or just waste a turn killing like a nothing unit. So you can feed him little units and yeah, he'll, he'll just dumpster them during the course of the game. Uh, but you can keep him basically from later on being able to charge his um, his like uh, his preferred target or whatever, and that's a that's a drawback. Obviously, this guy could end up in somebody's battle tome. Like maybe there's a whole centaur army coming at some point for destruction, or he just ends up printing in somebody's battle tome and his rules could change. But as of right now, he's 760. He'll kill stuff real good. But I also feel like he's going to be more manipulative, manipulatable, <laughs> able to be manipulated. Um, than your average like super murder engine that, that he he definitely is. He also doesn't have any built-in healing. Loon Shrine uh, gets updated basically to add in sh um, in addition to the shooters and stabbers that can normally come back in the book. Um, if you have a Spider Fang uh, general, a Squig general, or a Trogoth general, those guys coming back. So it just combines all the rules from the White Dwarf into one, which is just a handy, cleaner way of doing it. And then we get Jaws and Mork, Glogs, Mega Mob, and Grim Skettle Tribes, which are all the White Dwarf updates to the Gits uh, as their own like printed thing. I didn't notice any changes to this. It seems pretty much the same um, as what was printed in White Dwarf. So there's not really a lot new here. And it's nice to have a codified, so if you don't have the White Dwarf, it's all in one place. All right, Lariel. Well, she's changed again. <laughs> um, obviously, she still comes with a 200 point for a unit, which is nice. I mean, less if it's a branch witch or a tree lord. But the Kurnoth Hunters are nice to get for free. 20 Dryads. It's 160 or 120 for doing tree revenants or um, spite revenants. And you can make Dryads. You can summon them. So typically, you're going to take the Kurnoth Hunters. You might take a tree lord. I don't see a lot of reason to take it compared to the Hunters because the Hunters are. The, I think the most points you can get out of that um, that free soul M4A. Uh, 16 wounds, 3 plus save, bravery 10. Her move degrades from 16 to 12, drops off a bit, and she still has a not quite at half bracketing system. So she doesn't have a modern bracketing system, which a lot of, like the turtle has that now. There's a bunch of things that don't, they go to half. Like she doesn't go to 8, she starts degrading right away after 3 wounds, which is, I mean, not great, but the great antlers drop off real fast. That's her main damage source. So having the Great Antlers drop off immediately and going from a potential of 20 damage down to only 4 damage, the bottom half of that, not great. Um, what is great though is Life Bloom. Life Bloom has come right back to being amazing. Uh, it is in your hero phase, heal 2d6 wounds allocated to this model. So on average, you're going to come back above bracket, which makes this wound suffer thing not so bad on a, a roll of 7. You really need to kill her. Uh, over the course of a battle round without the you know, chance of just coming right back online. And also she heals uh, D3 wounds allocated to each friendly silver, but I think wholly within 30 of her. So that's that's a nice healing pulse all the time. Her point value did go up uh, appropriately though. She's got living battling ram, so um, she does uh, an impact hits basically to every unit within one. So on a one, nothing happens. Two to five is D3 mortal wounds, six is D6. Uh, I already went through the Soul M Fure, just anywhere on the table, not with a 9 of, uh, sorry, wholly with a 9 of this model, not with a 9 of the enemy. Not anywhere on the table, it's with a 9 of her. Um, she can still retreat and charge. She gets Swirling Glow Spites. So she gets something that Kragnos doesn't, and I think Kragnos should have. The ability to retreat and shoot and charge later on is a huge deal. And she flies, right? So she can just go over top of whatever's fighting her as long as she can clear it at the end of it all. And going 16 when she's healthy and healing means she can usually just land where she wants to land. And that's a big deal. Uh, Town of the Dwindling, I mean, it's so corner case. I don't even, like, it's four attacks, threes and fours, no rend, one damage. 
But every time you get allocated a wound by it on a deep, uh, deep like roll dice on a six, you're just dead. You're slain. On a one to five, it's negated. So super dangerous, but I mean, better against some things than others. Some of the low armor save, like against the Sons of Bamat, that's terrifying that like you might just take a wound and die because you have a four plus armor save. She can go in, randomly do like one or two wounds, one gets failed, and then just pop a six and be gone. Uh, still cast three, dispels three. She got metamorphosis uh, on seven, pick an enemy within 16 invisible. Uh, roll number dice equal to the casting roll on a three plus take a mortal wound. In addition, if, they're just, if the unit's destroyed by um, the mortal wounds caused by the spell, you get to put place an awakened wildwood, which is nice. And then her command ability is Garand's Wrath. Um, if this model is in your army, you can use it in the command, uh, command ability at the start of the combat phase. If you do so, real wound rolls for one uh, for attacks made by friendly Sylvaneth units, wholly within 14 of this model until the end of the phase. You combine that with Gnarl Root, and all of a sudden she's a wizard projecting a 12 inch reroll once to hit and a 14 inch reroll once to wound. Um, and yeah, she's going to be a really nice Gnarl Root leader, uh, but again, it's a hefty price tag. Comes with a free 200 point units, so you have to think she's. If you're taking one of the 200 point options, which is probably going to be Colonel Hunters, if you take you know three Colonel Hunters with her, she's 560, you know, built in. Like you're basically just choosing to take a Colonel Hunter unit and then her. Uh, and the built-in healing, I think, is really tasty, as well as that command ability is really nice too. War Song Revenant, uh, eight inch move, seven wounds, five plus save, uh, bravery eight. She, it's got three inch range with five attacks, reason three is minus one, two damage. So actually relatively fighty for being a cast two to spell one wizard. Uh, she's a cast two to spell one wizard with unleash swarm of spites. It sounds, I think it's almost the same as the swarm of spites on the, uh, what call it, the uh, branch witch. It's on a uh, seven plus and then uh, roll for each enemy unit within nine. Um, and you roll it uh, equal to the casting roll. So if you roll up, if you spike high dice, you know what I mean? So it's going to be at least seven dice on a five plus. They take a mortal wound for each dice that you roll and nine. It's not wholly within nine. So she's, that's, a, that's a pretty big pulse of like potentially exploding mortal wounds. And it doesn't matter how big the unit is too. So if you get a nice high casting roll and you catch a bunch of characters in that aura, you could, you know, easily, if you spike high dice, like obliterate or do a big chunk of wounds on them. Very handy for picking up little um, groups of characters too. Like uh, again, Gloop Spike gets things like the, uh, what you call it, Gobblepalooza would explode near that. Illyrial Song, add one of the bravery characteristic for Sylvaneth that are wholly within 12 of any models of this ability, and subtract one for any enemy models that are within 12 of this ability because they don't like this spooky music. And then Arboreal Cloak, a 4 plus Wind Shrug, uh, and Wildwood Revenants, add one to casting, dispelling, and unbinding rolls for this model if they're within 9 of Awakened Wildwoods. So, an interesting, I mean, not a bad fighter. 4 plus Wind Shrug with 7 wounds, and if you've got Illyrio in the army, she, you know, all that built-in healing is going to mean that that half shrug, she effectively has 14 wounds and can come back. So the armor save doesn't really matter with the built-in wound shrug. It's a bit like an expensive version of um, the Fungoid Cave Shaman, but with a neat like middle of the army ability. So you want to keep this fairly combat central to get that Unleashed Swarm of Spites off. And the cast two is nice. Being able to cast two to spell one. I think they pair pretty well together, but I mean, you are looking at like a 960 point investment in heroes for just the two of them. Uh, but five casts, three dis sorry, five casts, four dispels out of two models is a lot, and they're pretty hard to kill. The Wildwood um, has uh, got an updated War Scroll. So basically, you can place it as per the usual when you choose a, a Sylvanath Army, include a Wildwood train feature. In addition, you may be able to add them later on. Uh, each one is one of three scenery pieces. After territory has been determined, you can set up any friendly awakened wildwood territory uh, terrain features taken as part of your army wholly within your own territory, more than three inches from um, other terrain features and objectives. If both players can set up terrain features after territory has been placed, you roll off. Any abilities that allow you to add awakened wildwood terrain features to the battlefield will tell you how to set them up. In addition, they must be set up more than three from other terrain features and objectives. If an Awakened Wildwood has uh, more than one scenery piece, each piece must be touching to form a single circle. And then Overgrown Wilderness, uh, visibility between two models, is blocked if there's a straight line one millimeter uh, wide drawn between the closest points of the two models passing within across more than three inches of Awakened Wildwood. Uh, visibility to or from uh, models with a wound characteristic of 10 or more is not blocked. So your tree men can't hide it, uh, but they can also see through it. And then visibility from units with a Sylvanath keyword is never blocked by Awakened Wildwood, which is nice. So you can always see through them if you're Sylvanath. And if you have 10 or more wounds, you can see through them if you're anybody else. And then Vengeful's Forest Spirits. At the end of the charge phase, roll dice for each unit that does not have the Sylvanath keyword that's within an inch of an Awakened Wildwood. Add two if any wizards or endless spells are within six. 
on a six plus to take D3 Mortal Wounds. So now it's a four plus pop. You have a wizard nearby to take D3 Mortal Wounds uh, if you're within one inch of an Awakened Wildwood. So a bit more dangerous. The scenery rules are a bit less restrictive for you, which is nice as well. And then Draka Spike Grove, uh, Draka, and then two Spite Revenant units. Basically, you gain um, uh, rent to your Cruel Talons and Fangs, which is kind of cool. All right, Dexessa. The Talon of Slanesh, 12 inch move, 10 wounds, 4 plus A, bravery 10. Uh, it's not quite a Keeper of Secrets, right? So it's like a baby Keeper of Secrets, like an exalted demon version of a Keeper of Secrets. Uh, Scourge of Slanesh, 3 inch range, 4 attacks, 2s and 3s, minus 1, 2 damage. It's pretty hitty. And then Impaling Talon, uh, 2 attacks, 3s and 3s, minus 2, 2 damage. So, I mean, that's a potential uh, 8, 12 damage in melee, which isn't terrible. Um, Fleeting Dance of Death, run, retreat, and still charge in the same turn. I love that so many models have this now because it, it makes them harder to pin down. Joyous Battle Fury, after this model is fought the first time at the start of the battle round, add one of the attack characteristics of this model's weapons for the rest of the battle. This effect is cumulative, so every time it fights um, at the start of each battle round, add one of its attacks. So it's going to go to, like, basically, by the, if it fights in the first round, it's going to go by the end of the game to nine damage to attacks. And then Impaling Talon's going to have seven attacks. So it gets more dangerous later on. Uh, you're always minus one to hit it. And then do not take Battleshock tests for friendly Slanesh Demons within 12. In addition, once per turn, this model can issue a command to a friendly Slanesh Demon unit without a command point being spent. So you can all at attack. Uh, and you are also a Slanesh Demon. So you could just all at attack yourself every turn for free. So you always reroll ones, which is nice when you hit on twos. Um, and I mean, the point value for Dexessa is not excessive either. You're looking at... Mm, 280, which is a not super high price tag for a non-degrading 10 wound 4 plus save demon. Especially in an army that can summon greater demons later on in the game. <laughs> so having that as your, uh, one of your, your heroes is not terrible. And then Senesa, the voice of Sinesh, 9 wounds 4 plus save, so... Not quite as hard to kill, but 12 inch move as well. Uh, has a gun, Staff of Slanesh, 18 inch range, one attack, but works uh, in a, you know, a, a special way. Um, don't pick a target or use the attack sequence. Instead, pick an enemy unit within range and visible to them. The opposing player must roll a dice for this unit. If the roll is less than their save, but not a six, they take D6 mortal wounds. If the roll is equal or greater than their save characteristic, but not a six, they take D3 mortal wounds. On a six, nothing happens. So on a six, you're always safe. If you fail your save, you take D6 mortal wounds. If you pass your save, it's D3 mortal wounds. It's just, it's just, it just does it too. Like there's no like, maybe you roll to hit and maybe you don't roll to hit. Um, and then it also gets minus one all of its attacks against it. The impaling talent is three attacks, threes and threes minus two, two damage. So not super heady, but not anything to, you know, ignore. Um, and as voice of Slanesh, if this model uses a command ability to one friendly unit, that friendly unit can be anywhere on the battlefield as long as it's visible. If this model issues a command to more than one friendly unit, one of those friendly units can be anywhere on the battlefield as long as it's visible to this model. In addition, if this model successfully casts Whispers of Doubt or Pavane of Slanesh, the hero affected by the spell could be anywhere in the battlefield as long as the hero is visible to the model. So unlimited range for your command abilities uh, and also for those spells. And then uh, you can cast one on bind one, and the Whispers of Doubt spell is cast on six, if cast, pick an enemy hero within three of the cast are invisible and roll 3d6. If the roll is equal to or greater than that hero's bravery, add one to hit rolls for attacks that target them until your next hero phase. So a great way to upgrade your own army and your monster's ability to, to fight, basically, uh, by picking out a hero and being like, everyone's plus one to hit them. Um, and of course, obviously, the neat thing is, as long as you can see them, it doesn't need to be within three-inch range. You just whisper to everybody. Again, not inexpensive voice slash 260 a bit cheaper um but not terrible either i wish it cast two i feel like for two like compared to the war song it just if that's the magic one slash you got to do better the war song is significantly better at what it does being like a, a sort of a locust model that floats around and blows up and i mean you know there's the argument like uh oh, yeah but you got to take it for the army that's put into Mm, it's only 15 points more for the war song and it casts two it has a lot more damage output than the staff of slanesh which is just like a i look at you i probably i may be like 50 percent of the time save most saves are four plus i'll do you know d6 mortal wounds maybe d3 um if i float in the middle of your army with that um war song revenant and get that uh sort of sprites off that could be way more than d6 mortal wounds 
and d6 is swingy too it's not always it's not always going to spike high uh, versus like if you're rolling seven dice fishing for fives against multiple units you're probably going to on average get more than uh, the average roll of a d6 and then the exquisite pursuit uh this is the special uh, battalion that i think was from the the two-player starter set and it's got uh the epitome uh fiends of a unit and a seekers unit and then the epitome is considered to be unique the mirror of twisted truths in your shooting phase you can pick one of the units within three of luxian and Vresca, or pick one of the unit within 12 of your luxian and Vresca, and more than three from any other units in your army roll dice for each model in that unit if it has a wounds characteristic of one for each six it takes mortal wound if it's more than one, for each six, it takes D3 mortal wounds. The bigger they are, the more they get messed up. All right, we got a new free city. The free city of Excelsis. Um, so you can give it this keyword you're playing Cities of Sigmar. Uh, you're going to get these following battle traits. You have to be from Gur, so only using magic items from Gur if you're allowed to use magic items from um, the different realms and spells. Gift of Prophecy. Once per phase, when you pick a friendly unit to shoot or fight, you can say the attack has been prophesied. If you do so, roll a dice. On a 1, subtract minus 1 from hit rolls for attacks made by that unit. On a 2 to 6, add 2. Or sorry, add 1 to the hit rolls for the, the attacks made by that unit. So, on a 1, you get the prophecy wrong. On a 2+, plus, um, you just get plus 1 to hit. So, and that doesn't cost you anything. It's not a command ability. It's just once per phase, per phase, uh, when you pick a friendly unit to shoot or fight. So... Get a big hammer unit and a big cool shooting unit and make that like remember you can take handguns you can take a whole lot of handguns and then that unit every shooting phase gets plus one to hit and then you can take halberdiers a whole lot of halberdiers and then during their fight phase they get plus one to hit unless you roll a one and then your command abilities were post uh, you can use this command ability at the start of your combat phase. If you do so, pick a friendly Excelsis unit wholly within 12 of a friendly Excelsis hero. If the unmodified save roll for an attack that targets that unit in that combat phase is 6, the attacking unit suffers a mortal wound after all the attacks have been resolved. So basically you get, uh, whatchamacallit, ogre iron fists for your guy for a command ability. I mean, if you dive a, a hero into a huge unit of like multi dudes, like someone who's going to throw a million dice at you and make you make a million saves of like one damage, it could be useful. Command traits, cunning foe, you can retreat and still charge in the same turn. If you do so until the end of the turn, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this general and subtract minus one from attacks to target them. That's pretty cool. Just the ability to retreat and charge can be really cool for like a big mounted character. So you could take a black dragon. Um, if you're allying in Stormcast, you could take a Star Drake and give them cunning foe. So they can retreat and still charge now and also get plus one to hit and minus one to hit them. That's a, uh, yeah, Master of Intrigue, Star Drake, cunning foe equals interesting um or any of the mounted big heroes that you can you can label into a, a, a series of sigma army and then uh, in the right place at the start of the first battle round you can pick d3 friendly units and set them up again uh darkest secrets at the start of the combat phase you can pick one enemy hero within three of the general they can't use command abilities until the next co uh, combat phase uh your artifacts power are secret heirlooms the glimmering uh once per battle and this is made from the tree the uh, spear of malice or sorry, it's a big rock, maybe? It's something sitting in the middle of the city. Or maybe it's a horn? I don't remember. It's, anyway, big thing they, they carve pieces off of. Once per battle, before you make a hit and wound roll for an attack made by the bear, a save roll for an attack that targets the bear or run or charge, you can say that you will foretell the result. If you do so, you choose the result of the roll. The chosen result, uh, the result for a chosen, the, sorry, the result chosen for a d6 roll has to be a whole number between 1 and 6. And for a 2d6 roll has to be between 2 and 12, and the result cannot be re-rolled, but any modifiers are applied to it as normal. So, basically, um, let's say it's for a hit. Uh, so you couldn't use it like for a Star Trek bike, it's a mount attack. I'm trying to think of what good things proc on sixes. <laughs> Anyone who can join a City of Sigmar army where I can make a six happen, someone's going to... Actually, a Luminarch might be good for that, because I think they are their gun ability. Let me look. There's something I know. See Sigmar that is super handy to roll a six on. Maybe it's a Luminarch. Luminarch of Hish. With ba wait, Battle Mage? Mm, is this the one I'm thinking of? No. Searing Beam. Yeah, there we go. Searing Beam of Light. Pick a line. For each roll that is equal greater than the Searing Beam of Light value from the damage table, it takes two, three more wounds. Two plus? No, it's not that one. Um, nope. No, nope, he's not must he must not be what I'm thinking of. Uh Star Drake. I don't think his mount attack really matters. 
Because the cavernous jaws is cool, but you're you're not gonna get to reroll that or use that because it's not an attack. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna be somebody. <laughs> I can't think of who, but I'm sure City of Sigma players are shedding at their screen right now. Uh, Rock Jaw. In your shooting phase, pick an enemy with an eight of the uh, bearer and visible to them and roll a dice on a three plus to take D3 model wins. Take that Hellfire Sword from Slaves of Darkness. Like, it's just a better version of the Hellfire Sword, but you can use it forever as opposed to once per game. Uh, and then the Griff Feather Charm, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks, target the bearer, and get plus one move. Nice. It's a tasty item still. Uh, your spell lures, the Amber Spear. Cast on six, pick a point in the battlefield within 12 of the caster and draw a line to it. Um, each unit other than the caster that has any models that passes uh, that are passed across by it, take a model wound. Flock of Doom, cast on six, pick an IMU within 18 and visible and roll 12 dice for every six, take a model wound. And then Cower, cast on six, if successfully cast, pick an enemy monster within 12 and visible and roll 2d6. If it's higher than their bravery, the monster cannot make a charge move in your opponent's next turn because you spook it. All right, and then we got Duralia and Galen Van Denst, father-daughter duo into hunting endless spells, zombies, and other monsters. Um, same core stats, except he's slightly faster, a five-inch move, but five wounds each, four plus saves, and bravery um, eight. They both have Grim Resolve, which is a five plus wound shrug, cool. Uh, she has Sure Shot, which means add one to her crossbow's attacks and to hit rolls if they don't move. So she has one attack, 24 inch range, threes and threes, minus two, two damage. So she's twos and threes, minus two, two damage if she doesn't move, which is nice. And they both carry weapons of banishment. Um, double the damage characteristic of an attack made by this well, model's weapons if they target a wizard or demon. In addition, when this model chooses to fight or shoot, you can attack an endless spell instead of a unit. Um, and roll to hit it. If you hit, don't roll to wound. Roll 2d6 instead of it's higher than their uh, casting value. It's dispelled, so they can kill endless spells. Very cool, actually, for like um, the techless hex rune bomb, which is horrifying and terrible. Uh, Galen, in addition to the other rules, also has agile opponent. He can retreat and still shoot or charge during the turn. Um, they both have witch hunter swords. He has double the attacks though, so it's three attacks, three and threes, minus one one damage for her. He has six attacks, threes and threes, minus one, one damage. And then he's got three pistol shots, threes and threes, minus one, one damage. Cool little heroes. I mean, they're Cities of Sigmar and Witch Hunters. Uh, 115 each might be a little steep. I mean, the Wound Shrug's nice. I feel like she's the more impressive of the two, just as a sniper. And being able to shoot Wizards and Demons, like... That's two twos and threes minus two four damage attack. <laughs> it's being able to put out eight damage potentially against a wizard, um, as long as it doesn't have the, uh, actually it's any, she can do to anybody. So she can even hit with um, lookout sirs on threes and threes minus two four damage. So, this is pretty good. She's a really good wizard sniper. She definitely kills some, I mean, there's not a lot of eight wound wizards out there. So I, I feel like she's a good investment. I don't know that he's actually as interesting as she is tactically. Because she does all the same stuff as him, except at range, which is just inherently better, because she'll be acting for more of the game. Um, and they have the same core stats, really, except for his move being slightly faster. And with a wound shrug, she's pretty survivable. So 115, I can see that being an interesting an interesting take in an order army. And then Lord Croak. Oh, there he is, the lizard, the legend. Move five, 18 wounds, four plus save, bravery nine. He's got a force barrier, which is C below. Reason three is minus one one damage, a three inch range. It's just supposed to be, I think, the, the one little the one little dude fighting. He flies, arcane vassal. Uh, when you cast a spell before making the casting roll, you can pick either a friendly skink wizard or an oracle model within 12. Sorry, that's within 12 of this model or a friendly oracle anywhere in the battlefield. And um, you can use range invisibility from it. Your force barrier, its attack characteristic is equal to the number of any models within three. And each model counts, and each monster counts as five. So the more in the middle of stuff you are, the more you attack. You've been dead a long time. At the end of each phase, if any wounds or mortal wounds are allocated, this model roll 3d6 and have the number of wounds or mortal wounds allocated. On a 20 plus, this model is slain. On any other roll, you're just completely healed. <laughs> oh my god. So he has 18 wounds and no wound track. Oh wow. So, when you get to nine wounds though, on average, you die, which is not great. It means you can live a long time, um, you die, and you don't have to roll any dice, but 
once you get to more than nine wounds, chances are on average you die at the end of uh, any at the end of every phase. But you have to do more than nine wounds in a single phase to kill him. Otherwise, he just comes back to eighteen wounds. Again, if you can, I mean, I guess, I guess we know who could do it, which would be Kragnos. But if you can do eighteen wounds to a dude with a four plus save in a single phase, you're you're doing pretty good anyway. Um, at the start of your hero phase, roll three dice, and each four plus you get a command point. Uh, Supreme Master of the Order, add two to cast a spell and unbind rolls for this model. In addition, this model can attempt to unbind enemy spells anywhere in the battlefield, because you're croak. And you cast four to spell four, you know everything, uh, including Celestial De Deliverance and Comet's Call, and all of the Celestial Dominion spells, or Domination spells from Seraphon's Battle Town. Uh, Celestial Deliverance, caster can attempt to cast this spell up to three times in the same hero phase. Uh, Celestial Deliverance has a casting value of seven, the first time it's cast, uh, uh, sorry, and then it's an 8 and then a 9 every time you cast it. Each time it's successfully cast, pick three different enemy units within 10, invisible, and roll one dice for each unit you pick on a 2 plus that take D3 mortal wounds. If they're a demon, uh, chaos demon unit, on a 2 plus, they suffer 3 instead of D3. So, I mean, you explode basically a whole bunch. <laughs> um, on every uh, three units within 10. Then Comet's Call. Um, it casts on a 7. If cast, pick up to D3 different enemy units anywhere in the battlefield, and each of those units suffers D3 mortal wounds. If it was a 10 plus, pick D6 instead of D3. Uh, and then your command ability is the Supreme Gift from the Heavens. Uh, you can use command ability in your hero phase. If you do so, pick D3 friendly Seraphon units wholly with an 18 year friendly model with this command ability. To your next hero phase, those units can fly and get plus 1 to save rolls against missile weapons. <laughs> Sweet. And that's it for Croak. Now, I mean, he's kind of the god of the slan at this point. They don't get a god, they get him. He's only 430 points, though. That kind of seems like a deal for a guy that's real hard to kill. 430 for cast, 4 to spell 4. Explodes into mortal wounds and is almost impossible to kill. Like, just comes back to life if you don't kill him in one go. I think you're going to see a lot of him on the table. All right, the Skaven Tide. Uh, this, um, if your army is a Skaven Tide army, you can use the new hidden weapon to use battle traits below. In addition to any other battle traits you use, you can also use the uh, Clan Molder Mutation Allegiance abilities on the following page. So, battle traits, Teachings of the Horn Rat. It's basically a Skyr weapon team thing. Um, when you select a weapon team unit other than a warp grinder to be part of your army, you can pick a friendly unit of Clan Rats or Storm Vermin that has 10 or more models to hide inside. Record on a piece of paper. Don't set them up. Um, and basically, at the start of your shooting phase, you can reveal one or more hidden weapon teams. If you do, set them up wholly within three of a unit was hiding inside and more than three from the enemy. And uh, they can shoot in a turn in which they were revealed as long as they were hiding uh, and didn't run in the same turn. So, like, if the unit you're in runs, then you can't shoot. In addition, at the end of the sh charge phase, you can reveal one or more hidden weapon teams that were hiding and then set them up within three. Um, and they have to be, uh, it can be set up within three if the. Uh, of any enemy it's and it can fight in the falling phase. So basically they're kind of like almost like fanatics or old assassins You can charge in and then reveal a weapon team to go fight uh, Hidden weapon teams are destroyed if they're a unit their hiding is destroyed before they're revealed So you can reveal them in the shooting phase or the charge phase and it means your opponent doesn't really know where they are But you do have to write it down. So there's no like keeping them off if a Skaven Tide army includes any Fighting Beast units, uh, one of them can have a mutation. In addition, uh, when pick a Fighting Beast unit to benefit from the prize creation's battle trait, you can choose to have a Clan Molder mutation instead of adding D3 to its wound characteristic and rerolling hit rolls of one. Declare which Fighting Beast unit will have the Clan Molder mutation and then choose or roll from the table. And you can't have the same one on more than one model. So Helmet Abominations have six to choose from. Uh, Toughen Sinews, your wounds go to 14 and get a four plus save. Lumbering Behemoth, uh, move uh, characters become 7 instead of random, uh, and you automatically roll a 7 to charge. And then Quivering Bulk, uh, plus 1 to dice to <laughs> see if you get your Affluence of Flesh ability. Uh, Accelerate re Regeneration, um, you can use this help at Deplanations Regenerating in the enemy hero phase and your own. Best, best Warp Stone Spikes, you can reroll the dice to use this Help at Abominations Warp Stone Spikes ability. In addition, you can reroll Wound Rolls of 1 for attacks made with melee weapons. And then never, never die, die. You can reroll the dice and use this uh, help at abominations too horrible to die ability. So the, the you can just reroll to see if you get back up when you die. And then rat ogres. Uh, the rat ogre you can have six wounds and a four plus save. Insanely rabid. Uh, the tearing claws, blades, and fangs attack characteristics become six. In addition, you can roll charge rolls for them. And then accelerated metabolism. 
This battle you get, unit has a move characteristic of eight. In addition, you can heal D3 wounds allocated to them in your hero phase. I mean, of those three, always having six wounds and a four plus save, being super fast or being super fighty, I think just always having more wounds. Having more wounds is just good on a four plus save. Although the healing could be, I mean, they have four wounds based. If you think about it, in your hero phase, so every other action, basically, they're going to get D3 back, or you just always have an additional 50% per model. I feel like having the additional 50% and then a higher save rate is probably just better. Real charges and more attacks is cool. I'd rather just be around longer. So I think the toughest to use is the first one you pick. Uh, and then we got some additional War Scroll Battalions. We got Ratachak's Doom Coven, which is your uh, special character, Ratachak, and then a Warp Lightning Cannon and a Storm Fiends unit. And you can get more more Doom Rocket. You can reroll hit rolls for attacks made with Ratchet's Doom Rocket and add one of the damage characteristic. In addition, add one of the damage characteristic of Shock Gauntlets used by Storm Fiends that are wholly within 12 of them. And then the Butcher Band for the um, uh, the Beastman, which is weird, it came before this. I don't know why you wouldn't print it afterwards. Um, it's a great Prey Shaman, so Gorgai, Goragon Kai, and two Bulgors and a Gorgon. Uh, you get Skull Staff, add to the attack characteristic of his Skull Staff. Uh, in addition, if the unmodified hit is a 6, it does D3 Mortal Wounds and it ends. Uh, infused with Chaos Energy, I want to hit rolls for uh, attacks made by Warherd units from this battalion that are probably within 12 of Gorgai Khan. And then Command Trait, uh, he gets the Indomitable Beast Command Trait automatically. Warpaths of the Beast Herds. Alright, so uh, if your army is a Beast of Chaos Army, you can use the Primal Instincts below. Uh, so the Primal Instincts, Gore Battle Fury, real charge rolls for friendly Gore units uh, if they were in reserve in an ambush and have been set up on the battlefield in the same turn. So they have to just show up outside of 9, but now you can reroll your charges. Neat, basically free CPs for rerolling charges, not needing to be near a hero. Um, it doesn't apply to the Gore keyword though, only the Gore War Scroll. Warhead Charge. After a friendly Warhorde unit makes a charge move, pick one enemy unit within one and roll a die on a two. Uh, sorry, add two if uh, the Warhorde unit's a hero or has three or more models. On a four plus, uh, that unit suffers D3 model wounds at the end of the charge phase. So basically you're gaining like an impact hit for your um, big big boys. The uh, Warhorde stuff I think is mostly, I think it's all just um, the Minotaurs. But let's look. Warhorde. Uh, sorry, the Doom Bowl, the Gorgon uh, gets it as well, actually. He's got the word, the, that same keyword. Uh, but he would not get any bonus because he's not a hero. But the Doom Bowl would. So the Doom Bowl would get it because he's a hero and he'd get bonus bonus basically to the dice roll. So he'd do it on a 2 plus instead of on a 4 plus. Raging Storm. At the end of the combat phase, you can roll a dice for each Thunderscorn unit in the battlefield. Add 2 to the roll if the Thunderscorn unit's a hero, has more than 3 models, or has some more than 3 models. Um, sorry, your units would get to do it on 2 plus 2. Um, on a 4 plus, you can heal a wound allocated to the unit. So your heroes and uh, your big, bigger units of um, Dragon Ogres are going to get back a wound. I wish it was D3. Why isn't it D3? That doesn't seem like it's as good. Then roll a dice for each enemy unit uh, within one of any friendly Thunderscorn units. Add 2 if they're uh, heroes or more than 3 models. And then on 4 plus, they take more than a wound. So you heal, they die. And then you get a new Beast uh, Lord scroll. Let's see what changed here. Beast Lord. Uh, core stats are the same. Ripper axes, six stacks, threes and threes, maximum one damage, the same. Call to battle. Um, new. Can run and still charge. That's kind of neat. And then Grizzly Trophy. Uh, is not a command ability anymore. So it's just, if any enemy models are slain by wounds inflicted by this model's attacks in the combat phase, you get plus one to wound for attacks made by friendly Brayherd units wholly within 18. In addition, if any enemy heroes or monsters are slain by wounds inflicted by this model's attacks in the combat phase, you can add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Brayherd units wholly within 18 until the end of the phase. The same unit cannot benefit from this ability more than once per phase. Uh, but it's not a command ability, it's just an ability. And then Hatred of Heroes, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with this model's paired man ripper axes uh, targets a hero and is a 6, it does 2 hits instead of 1. And then the Jabber Slythe, which is still a great model. 
It's a weird model, but a great model. Core stats are identical. Oh, no, it's a four plus save now instead of a five. Uh, it's Slithy Tongue is three attacks now. Threes and threes minus one, one damage, as opposed to just one at D3 damage. Vorpal Claws, six attacks, threes and threes minus two, one damage. Vorpal should be minus four rend. Just, it's Vorpal, come on. Spike Tail, three inch range, one attack, fours and twos now instead of threes, minus two, and then D3 damage. The run went up on that. And then Aura of Madness is subtract one from casting, dispelling, and unbinding for wizards within six, enemy wizards. In addition, each time an enemy, a unit within three of this unit, uh, is chosen to fight, roll 3d6 if it's greater than bravery until the end of the phase, they're deranged. Add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by the unit. However, if the unmodified hit roll for attack is a one, it takes a mortal wound after all its attacks have been resolved. So they start hitting themselves. Interesting. So they get extra dice to fight, but they might blow up. And then spurting bile blood, uh, roll a dice each time a wound inflicted by a melee weapon is allocated to a model and not negated on a four plus the attacking unit takes a mortal wound. So they blow up back at you when you fight them. And that's point values. Beast Lord's 95, Jabber Slice is 165, the Butcher Herd's 140. I don't know why you take it. It's kind of neat, I guess. Uh, I already went through Doralia and Galen. They are 115 each. Uh, Cragnus is 760, big boy that he is, but can be allied in if you don't take any other allies to any destruction army. The Gits get their Moonbiter Squigglanch for 90, Moonjumper Stampede for 140, Grim Scuttle Nest for 140, Grim Scuttle Skitter Swarm for 140, Grim Scuttle Spider Cluster for 140, and the Stomping Mega Mob is 160. Texessa is 280, and Senessa is 260, the Exquisite Pursuit's 130, Crook's 430, which I think is a bargain for him. Uh, the Skaven Tide's Doom Coven is 130, and then Alaria went up to 740. Warren's Sovereign Revenant is 275, and Draco's Spike Grove is 120. Again, I don't know why you take it. It doesn't seem great. Uh, and that's it. So, who are the winners in here? I mean, Kragnos, he's real good on paper. I don't know if he's practical. Uh, I really want to get him just to try him. I have a bunch of destruction stuff I still want to paint, and obviously my Ogre Army is near and dear to me, so I feel like he's a good slot in there. Um, yeah, I really like Duralia and Galen. I'm definitely getting them. And then Dexessa and Senessa. I think Dexessa is the winner out of those two, just because fighty. And Croak is a, a bargain at 430, I think. Alario, I'm not convinced about. I do want to get her to, to, to paint, and the War Song as well, just because obviously my... Um, Sylvanath Army, she's gone like this so much over the course of second edition that, like, she was real good, then she was okay, then she was real good, then she's okay. She just doesn't sit at the same power level as, like, a Teclas or a, um, you know, like an Archeon or something like that. Like, she's a lot of points. I don't know if she's sitting that high, but with the durability she has now and coming with that 200-point unit, maybe. If I, look, if I think about her in my head as being 540 as opposed to being as expensive as she is... Maybe, but that, and then also with core battalions, maybe getting rid of the need for me to take like a Wargrove or like the, um, the things to, to reduce my drops, she might find a place in my army. So I feel like Croak, yes. <laughs> Alario, I mean, yes, I'm gonna try it. I'm not sure. Kragnus is super cool. Durali is amazing. I think it as being like a um, little baby uh, wizard hunter. Uh, and other than that, yeah, it's just, it's cool updates to a variety of armies, but I think your mileage might vary. All right, there we go. Kragnos, the Broken Realms. Uh, we're finding out today what's in that cool new box for third edition, and obviously lots of cool new stuff this could mean in that edition. Who knows next month, but we'll be checking that out too. So anyway, big thanks for watching. We'll see you for more uh, GMG reviews in the future. Ton of mash. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can. 